Yes, the story of a shooting event on the New York subway system broke. We at Rising wondered how quickly the crisis would go from a generalized tragedy into a politicized event. As it turns out, we didn't need to wait long. New York Mayor Eric Adams characterized the shooting event, which left at least 26 people injured and thankfully no fatalities, as part and parcel of a, quote, cult of death that has taken hold in this nation, a cult that allows innocents to be sacrificed on a daily basis. He vowed to, quote, continue to dam the rivers that feed the sea of violence. How? Well, by doubling the number of police officers traditionally patrolling the system. But as many criminal justice reform advocates have pointed out, increasing the police force has not resulted in lower crime rates. In fact, in an interview conducted yesterday by Dana Bash on CNN, Adam seemed to struggle to explain why, despite branding himself as a former cop, tough on crime mayor who had the unique ability to address subway violence, transit crimes are up. I'm sure there are people in New York who say, wait a minute, I voted for a former cop to try to stop this, and it seems to be getting worse. What's your message to them? Uh, New Yorkers know every day I wake up to protect the city, and uh, they have trust in me as their mayor, and I have trust in the professionals that are carrying out the job of ensuring that our city is safe. And they're doing that every day. They're putting their lives on the line uh, to remove dangerous people off our streets and dangerous weapons um, off our streets. And we know we're going to get crime under control and the problem we're facing is a problem that is hitting our entire uh, nation right now. And that is why this is a national uh, response. We need a national response to this issue. We're going to do our job every day. As I indicated, 1,800 guns. Think about that in New York City. That's uh, when you think about only uh, three and a half months removing 1,800 guns. We're going to continue to do our job, but there is some assistance that's going to be needed uh, in our city, such as... Uh, empowering uh, ATF, uh, bring in the ATF leader, as the president announced yesterday, uh, making ghost guns illegal. Uh, there's so many things that we could do to assist the cities across America, particularly New York City, uh, to make sure that we're a safe place for our residents. Now, if you think you missed an answer to Bash's question about why Adams has not managed to bring crime down in New York, you're not alone. That wasn't an answer, just vibes. Nothing Adam said in that response has any bearing on yesterday's crime. Nominating a new director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms has little to no bearing on New York's subway crime rates. And there's no evidence at this time that a ghost gun, which is a gun with filed off serial numbers, was used in the attack. Nothing he said there, nothing addresses Dana's question about why New York's chief cop has overseen a rise in transit crimes, a jump of nearly 73 percent, despite a new anti-transit crime initiative, increased police funding last year, and calls for an even larger police budget by Eric Adams. But criminal justice advocates have a more satisfying explanation. More cops in subways may mean more turnstile jumpers in Rikers prison, but there is no correlation between increased police spending and increased public safety. According to reporting, reporting by Cleo Chang in New York Magazine, quote, the result of Eric Adams flooding the subway with cops to crack down on violent crime is 350 fare evasion arrests, 17,000 summons for misdemeanor crimes, and of course, a mass shooting and bombing plan, an actual violent crime that cops did nothing to prevent. New York public defender and criminal justice commentator Olayami Olarin, who we spoke to this morning about the shooting response, noted that Eric Adams is already using the Brooklyn subway shooting to call for more cops in the subways when he should be explaining to us why none of the multiple police officers that were in the station were able to prevent the incident, stop the shooter, or even get a proper description. Other New Yorkers offered pictures of what the New York police presence often looks like. Adults on their phones, standing around, collecting salaries while doing little, if anything, to catch people who have committed acts of violence. And nothing at all to address the underlying causes of crime. This is why it's hard to get away from defund as a political project. Every time there is an incident like this, there are calls to fund the police more, despite there being no relationship between increased funding and lower crime. The 2020 police budget in New York was already $11 billion, or 10% of the budget, with the largest share of that being sp spent on street patrol. Only two other city agencies, the Department of Education and the Department of Social Services, cost more. And police funding would outstrip DSS, but for $4.4 billion in Medicaid payments issued by that agency. 
and other cities have even more disproportionate funding of police as compared to social services. A full one-third of LA's budget goes to the police force. Oakland PD receives, receives nearly half of the city's discretionary spending, more than every other expenditure, including human services, parks and recreation, and transportation combined. And 39% of Chicago's 2017 budget went to police. Even the most ardent lover of police might question these funding priorities. At this point, the conversation shouldn't be about whether or not you support the defund movement in the abstract. It should be whether these agencies should be held accountable for failing to use public funds to fulfill their fundamental mission to keep us safe. The answer, obviously, is that it's failing in that mission. So why do we keep throwing money at this problem, hoping for a different result? Lawyer and author of Becoming Abolitionist, Derricka Purnell, opined yesterday on why police are the only profession who do their jobs badly and get more funding and legitimacy. It's a good question. Police are being put to an impossible task, to be the backstop for a crumbling social safety net and economic system that has become a breeding ground for antisocial behavior. The answer isn't to throw more officers at the problem, putting them in situations for which they are not trained and in which they are not supported. The answer is to fund programs that have a demonstrated effect on lowering crime. Zelensky has been extremely effective uh, in rallying Western support, and Western support has been tremendously fast and strong compared to what anyone had expected before this crisis. But it is quite remarkable how little it has resonated with folks outside of the West, particularly the global South. And it's to a very large extent because of this threat. Now, obviously, these countries have their own dependencies or Russia's or vulnerabilities uh, to Russia. And as a result, they have a degree of hesitancy. And that's been what most of the media focus has been on. But I think there's a deeper reason for this as well, which is when we are saying that this war is about the future of the rules-based order, that's where we're losing most of the global South. Because the rules-based order for most of the world has been the United States being able to do whatever it wants outside of international law, whether it is to invade Iraq, whether it is to invade uh, Libya, or, or a whole set of different ways in which the United States actually has eroded the rules-based order itself, such as, for instance, sanctioning the, uh, the judges of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, which we now want to take Putin to and, and try for war crimes. So it, it creates a situation in which essentially we're asking some of these states to make pretty severe sacrifices in order for them to help uphold a rules-based order that gave the United States the ability to act outside of that order. Essentially, we're asking them to make sacrifices for American exceptionalism. And that's precisely why this message is not resonating with them. And I want to emphasize, it's not that they're sympathetic necessarily to Russia or that they are sorry, that they're sympathetic to Russia or that they're not sympathetic to the Ukrainians. I think by and large, they do view this as a war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine. There may be various reasons for it in which they perhaps do uh, put greater weight onto uh, the expansion of NATO than what many folks in the West would do. But overall, their view is that Russia is the aggressor. But they're not going to make these sacrifices in order for the United States to be able to continue to act uh, under the rubric of American exceptionalism. Can you give us uh, more of an idea, put a finer point on the kinds of commentary that are coming out of the global south in this moment? Well, it, it's quite fascinating to see what they say. I think it was quite interesting, a piece in The Guardian uh, that quoted a gentleman who played a very important role in, in um, uh, both in Amnesty International, but also for a major African organization saying, you know, for decades, the West has been ravaging and, and colonizing uh, Africa, stealing its resources, etc. And then you had the Cold War in which a lot of the wars uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union were taking place in third countries, including in Africa. And now we're asked to allow that to happen again. Uh, and, and the comment was that just please don't bring your war to our shores. Mm. I thought it was quite fascinating that, that that is the perspective. They see this as a European conflict uh, about the European order, not about the global order. And as a result, they don't want to have any part of it. This is the main story, in my opinion, so I'm curious for your take, about what's going on in this country. This is the main thing that will matter, you know, come November. It will be a referendum, I think, on how Biden has handled rebuilding the economy in the wake of COVID. And a lot of these indicators, there's some good indicators, but a lot are bad. And clearly the mood of the country is that, is that it's not at all sufficient. And, and that's ultimately what matters, isn't it? 
it is the main story and we've seen republicans going back really to the middle or spring of 2021 really telegraphing that they would message on this and they are following through on that what's been interesting though is to watch the biden administration's response to this and to see how they've messaged around this um you know they've tried to label the rise in gas prices as putin's price hike uh, pointing to the impact of the Russian invasion on Ukraine could have on gas prices. Um, so we, we have that factor going. However, it remains unclear you know, how Ameri the American people and voters will respond to that messaging come November. You know, it's interesting, the NRCC, the House Republican campaign arm, you know, last July was uh, releasing 4th of July campaign ads talking about how energy prices just in time for your 4th of July barbecue were going to rise. So um, it's definitely something Republicans have been messaging on, but I'm curious to see how the Biden administration messages around it. And one other thing is we've seen the Biden administration continue need to push job growth saying you know we are at a faster rate of you know getting americans back to work and such however you know i'm curious what americans will think you know while more have a job you know they can't afford as much as they can used to at the grocery store gas prices are high so you know i think it's going to be a, a decision americans are going to have to make in their minds you know the job growth versus inflation but you know i think ultimately the rising prices uh, are going to have a big impact and that's going to be an issue for democrats when it comes to messaging ahead of november yeah, you know, Philip, when uh, Biden took office, I think inflation was about one and a half percent. It has now increased. Uh, February, it was 7.9. And now some estimates say that March might even be up to as high as eight and a half percent, which is really high, outrageously high. Is there any way that the Biden administration, do you think they can kind of talk their way out of this? I mean, is there anything they could say to get the voters to say, OK, yeah, you're right. Inflation, no big deal. I mean, they've tried talking their way out of it. At first, we heard that these were first world problems, that this was just transitory inflation that would eventually go away when we undid all the kinks in supply chain. This was just the economy running hot as we emerged from the pandemic. And then that shifted to uh, the fact that gas was more expensive because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The thing is, there's there's truth to all of that, right? That, you know, as we emerged from a pandemic that you were going to have um, as well as, you know, as we emerged from a pandemic after government had spent a tremendous amount of money, that we were going to have you know, more dollars chasing fewer goods. Um, and there's also truth to the fact that, you know, the invasion has, has spooked uh, global oil markets. But uh, I, I think that sort of you've got voters who will turn, tune that out, right? Because they, they've heard again and again all of these excuses for inflation and then will sort of roll their eyes. When they hear the White House say, well, hey, you know, the unemployment numbers are better than they have been before. Um, you know, they, we've got a, a great uh, jobs market right now. And voters will just say to themselves, OK, that's that's great. You know, it's never been easier to get a job um, and it's never been more frustrating to take a paycheck home from that job and, and see it not go as far. Um, so the White House, they, they can try and talk their way out of this. They can try and spin it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that the, the hard economic reality is. Uh, that you know your dollar isn't going as far as it used to and what they need to be worried about right now is not just that inflation continues but that consumers are starting to expect continue to uh, expect inflation to continue because when we have expected inflation when you have sort of a shared um you know gloomy outset of where the economy is going to be then that's when you sort of see um a, a spiral that is impossible to get out of yeah, Julia, do you think voters are buying? Are they persuaded by the kind of excuse making the administration's doing that? Oh, right. Well, we're in this Ukraine business. Of course, gas prices are going to be high. You know, that kind of there's always some kind of special exceptional scenario that excuses why. Well, it's, a, it's still, you know, COVID is still exists. Now it's the Russia, Ukraine. It, is that Will do voters eventually reach a point, or are they already they are they there already saying that doesn't that doesn't we don't we're not convinced by that we're not that's not an excuse. 
Right. I think to Philip's point, there are a number of factors that voters are considering. You know, I think there obviously has been some sort of effect on gas prices uh, as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the global market in general. That being said, though, they realize that there are other factors at play, whether it's uh, increased government spending, whether they believe that's uh, contributing to inflation coming out of COVID. Um, you know, I think they realize this is multifaceted, but I think the important factor to look at is when Americans or voters in general are unhappy with the economy, they're going to turn to the person in charge of the country, whether it's that person's mm -hmm. fault that inflation is rising or not. And that's Joe Biden. And there, since Joe Biden is not on the ballot this year, they are going to blame his party, the party that he is officially the head of. So that's where Democrats face an uphill battle. And on top of that, you know, historically, a first term president, um, you know, his or hers uh, party in the midterms, they tend to lose seats on Capitol Hill. So we've got a lot of factors going against Biden administration.